So I'm just, I'm Kristen Forster, sorry, you, you probably know that anyway if you're watching this channel. Um, and uh, this is Crumbs Under the Table, um, which is me walking and talking with my dogs and saying hello to a couple of swans. Oh, Banjo's causing some trouble there. They don't like you, Banjo. They really don't. <laughs> okay, so we'll leave the swans behind and um, I will say uh, a proper good morning. Um, <clears throat> and um, this morning, um, well, there's a few, a couple of days ago, I saw a little kind of article um, and um, the author, Martin Gladwell, if anyone's come across him, uh, he's a journalist with New York something or other. <laughs> he's written several books that are quite popular. His first, I think his first five were all in the top 100 kind of self-help books of, uh, for, yeah, one of those US lists. Um, things like The Tipping Point were the famous ones, I think. Um, but anyway, I just noticed he had this little comment which kind of got me thinking. Um, so his, uh, his comment was about the, the generation that's kind of coming through. I'm always cautious of overstating kind of the, the concept of generations got this or generations that, because obviously a generation has got lots of people in it, but everything kind of aggregates. And there are things that kind of get hold of the popular psyche and therefore to some degree um, do symbolically define a, a generation. He was just saying that the generation that's come through um, have, have kind of, um, and, and he didn't say that I'll add the bit that I've added, <laughs> he said, yeah, they, they've, um, they've forgotten the, the grace that was part of the Christian heritage of the Western world and the grace and forgiveness. Um, and I thought, yes, that's true. That is true. Um, so now if you do anything wrong, you, you, that can be, we can kind of, uh, we, we can dig it up years and years later and we can hold it against you. Um, and nobody is allowed to grow in their views or opinions and so on. You're all just, and well, actually, you're, you're always locked in to whatever the time or the moment was when you most clumsily expressed a view or an opinion. And that does seem to be part of the truth. The, the thing he didn't touch on, which I would add to it, is um, what they have inherited, sadly, from the kind of their Christian um, upbringing of the West, um, even if they didn't grow up in Christian homes, it is, um, is an approach to morality um, that desperately wants to be moral. <laughs> so they desperately want to be moral, but there's no grace in this, um, which is not a happy way to live. It's not a kind way to live either. And it's, it doesn't actually respect our humanity. Um, that, that is the wonderful thing about the gospel is that God actually demonstrates that he is willing um, to, to, to endorse and uphold our fallen humanity. <laughs> Um, recognizing the truth that it's better to live with ideals than to not live with ideals um, but the truth is we probably won't live up to our own ideals <laughs> and we need grace even for ourselves and he has that for us so I just thought this morning as a as that kind of was my prompting thought just be worth kind of thinking a little bit um, just about that the subject of grace <laughs> which is such a fantastic subject um, because uh, I do think that it's so often we misunderstand it. Um, and I think that's been true right the way from the earliest, earliest of days. Um, yeah, I think, um, is it uh, Philip Yanti wrote that book, which I never read, I have to confess, what's so amazing about grace. But I, I do like the kind of, the concept of the title because grace is hard to get your head around. Um, and as a result, there's an awful lot that has kind of come out as Christian truth about grace, which I, I don't think is actually the case. <laughs> Um, so, you know, um, let, me, let me kind of give some examples. I'm probably losing my train of, of thought now. But, um, you know, we... Um, <clears throat> so, so grace... Well, the, the, the word grace is sometimes translated to favour, sometimes translated as gift, but it's always there, charis, at the heart of it, um, in the Greek. Um, uh, and, 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 and Scripture tells us that God pours that out without measure. So it, it isn't that grace comes because we repent. Um, we, don't, we don't repent and therefore deserve grace. Grace has come first. And that, that, that mystery, although it's harder to kind of explain in a soundbite, actually is constantly presented as the mystery of the Old Testament. <laughs> Behold, I'll, I'll speak to you a mystery. And then what, what is the mystery? He doesn't exactly say, but it tells the story of Israel and how just when they're behaving their worst, God seems to act the most powerfully in terms of for them. <laughs> so, 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 
So one part of the confusion of grace is that even when we're in our worst place, when grace is committed to us, it's poured out on us without measure. But there is something whereby um, our response to grace does, does allow it to have its most powerful effect in us. And so it's not that we don't have anything to do, but it, grace definitely comes first. Um, and, and we think about that with forgiveness as well. You know, very often we say there's no forgiveness without repentance. That's another way of pushing it. No forgiveness without repentance. And sort of you sort of know what's true, but equally Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Those people are not repenting. They're just, in their ignorance, um, there is an appeal made to the Father that actually his grace should provide forgiveness for things we're not repenting for. And, and that's one of the incredible things, I think, about grace, is there are things I'm not even aware of that somehow he covers me in. And, and, and equally, things that I, I am aware of. Um, it's not that there aren't consequences to the bad I do, but actually somehow my relationship with the Lord is not dependent on those things. You know, so, so David sins terribly. I mean, he not only has an affair with Bathsheba, um, but he then has Bathsheba's husband um, put into the front line of the battle so that he dies. And, um, and, and he knows, he's, he is aware that that's not good. And of course he gets challenged by Nathan as a prophet and, uh, and so on. And, um, and he, he repents, <laughs> um, but then he gets on with his relationship with the Lord. Uh, and yes, there are consequences and the Lord doesn't withhold him and protect him from the consequences. Um, and so sometimes we use that phrase, well, you've got to forgive and forget. But actually, that's also not always the case. <laughs> We forgive, but actually we need to learn as well. And, uh, and actually there are consequences, and, and actually you, you can't somehow remove all the consequences from when someone's behaved badly, because otherwise we say we're getting in the way of grace, because that's not what grace is about. <laughs> um, yeah, now, so now someone's going to ask me, so what is grace all about? <laughs> um, grace is God's initiative, it's part of his character, it's part of his nature. And grace has more to do with the goodness of God when he created mankind with even the possibility. See, even the fact that God made the possibility for, for people who are in his likeness, but whose perspective and limited understanding and limited knowledge would mean that they would freely choose, even though they're in relationship with him, things that would hurt him and that he would not like, shows us how his grace was a part of his nature, even in creation before there was anything to forgive somehow it is a deep deep part of who god is and and it's perhaps it's for those kind of reasons that i think that just as i find with the cross i get suspicious when i've got my head around it too easily <laughs> um I, I speak to myself i'm not blaming you for that <laughs> um you know if i if i go oh, i know what the cross is all about it's like a b and c that was easy oh <laughs> really really is it that easy is grace that easy to get our heads around? No, I don't think it is. <laughs> um, and so we constantly have that internal battle. And well, let's sin that grace may abound, is the way Paul put it. Um, how do you do these things? It doesn't quite logically work, but somehow we instinctively know it when we meet it. Um, so we understand when we meet someone whose life exhibits grace. So not only are they now receiving grace, so grace is being poured on everybody. <laughs> makes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. He makes the rain to come on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Um, he blesses me when I'm at my best, but also when I'm at my worst. <laughs> it's one of the lessons I've learned over the years. <laughs> um, and because he does that, and because he blesses me when I'm at my worst, then I'm tempted to sin that may, grace may abound. Oh, that's okay, because God's still good to me. And I've seen the most terrible tragedies that happen because people have lived in that under that the truth of grace like that <laughs> people who've had affairs and God's not kind of taken withdrawn his presence from them and so they have another and then they have another and then the next things are going and the families are being broken up all over the place somehow grace is both connected to who we are but it's also totally independent of it <laughs> and when I try and put my finger on it and try and stitch it all together I, I never quite get it <laughs> but I am so glad for the gospel of grace um, and so as we deal with the world that we live in you know as, as many of you be aware I, I, I coach 
um, from a kind of a, a developmental point of view, uh, using the, uh, the best of, of secular psychology, as well as um, look to pastor and development people, develop people from a spiritual point of view. <laughs> um, and, and in that, that context, um, <clears throat> in that context, I, I want to have total understanding and grace of the truth of people's humanity and to love their humanity but also say part of your humanity is to transcend your humanity. I, I kind of see some of that in the creation story where it says of God that he, he takes the dust of the earth and out of the dust of the earth he makes the cattle. <laughs> so you thought I was going to say humans then, didn't I? <laughs> didn't you? But he makes, he makes cows. <laughs> and we share the same physiology as the animals around us, but then he breathes his spirit into us. And there is a tension of truths in two directions. We have an animal nature. <laughs> Paul sometimes refers to it as a, as a human nature. But that's not intrinsically sinful, but we have given, been given a nature that looks up and draws us for an upward call. And so I want to, I, I want to celebrate the goodness of God's creation in my animal nature, but I don't want to divorce that or excuse the fact that I'm equally supposed to have a spiritual vision that, that draws me upwards. And so I, 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 I sacralize the things that are most animal-like in me. When we eat meals, we might say grace. We eat with knives and forks off plates. We cook fancy meals. We, we, we make a celebration of what's actually a very animal instinct. My dogs will scoff anything. <laughs> they will chuck it back, then they will chuck it up, and then they'll chuck it back again. <laughs> it's the way dogs work, isn't it? <laughs> See, they'll just eat anything. Um, but we, we kind of make it special. Um, and sex. <laughs> Well, animals will up wherever they will, whenever they're in season, whenever they fancy it. But actually, we celebrate it. We put, we put ceremonies around it. We make it a public event that we, we, we focus on the raising of children. And in all of these things, it's not the things themselves that are holy, but we are making holy something that is part of our animal nature. Somehow we are lifting it to heaven. <laughs> but if we're going to do that, we really do need grace. Because if you want to live out of a kind of a legalism and a, and a kind of morality that is based on your own efforts, you'll never get there. Um, and like the generation that's kind of coming up behind us has been taught to do, you believe in morality, you want to be moral, and now you'll, darn it, <laughs> you're going to make sure everybody knows how good you are and how bad they are, and we're not going to forgive anything when you get it wrong. <laughs> uh, grace and truth are realised in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's probably my prayer for the day. <laughs> so maybe I won't say too much else at this stage. So it's been good to be with you again this morning. Um, if I've shad... <laughs> I was thinking of that verse, not verse, quote from Shakespeare, isn't it? If you shadows, we have offended. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, I don't always get things right, but that's the wonderful thing about grace. It's the wonderful thing about grace. Well, that's all I've got to say today. So I'll see you next time then. Bye. <laughs>